Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Hitherto thy love has blessed me Thou hast brought me to this place And I know thy hand will bring me Safely home by thy good grace Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Met me with his precious blood Oh, to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter Bring heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above A couple announcements for today A Teen Girls Bible Study will be today uh, After the morning service, so do mark that um, This evening Pastor, do you want me to make mention that uh, there we have having a church membership service? Um, anything you want to say about that? All right. So if you want to be a member, you better be here tonight. Um, May 22nd, we are planning our next junior activity, um, movie night. Uh, they're going to watch a, a movie downstairs, have some pizza, um, popcorn and whatnot. There is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. If you would like to come, make sure you sign up. The cost is $3.00 per junior, okay? Uh, May 23rd, uh, the following day, on Sunday evening, we are planning a teen destination unknown. It'll be after the evening service. Do bring a little bit of money with you, um, but we'll have a good time with that. And then May 30th, that's the following Sunday, uh, we are planning to have our next teen service, teen service. So uh, we're excited about that. There will be a, fu a fundraiser meal to follow the service that week. Um, a little farther out here, June 11th, we have uh, pegged for our chicken plate sale. Uh, so I will be giving you some, uh, some tickets and things like that here in the next week or so, teens and teen parents to help raise money for the missions trip. Um, June uh, 26th is our Women on a Journey Conference. June 26th. Do you mark that, mark that on your calendars? And there's two things that I wanted to add that aren't in our bulletin. I know some of you have asked me, and I've... Uh, I wanted to make sure I could give you solid dates that weren't tentative. So uh, June 28th through July 2nd, it's the last week in June, is Junior Camp Week, okay? Uh, I sent out instructions to as many people as I could remember. If you, I forgot it, I was also having phone issues, but if I forgot to send you a message or if you didn't get one but would like to send a junior to camp, make sure you see me and I will give you instructions on how you can get your child registered for junior camp, okay? Um, it's not that cr crazy, but there is an online registration process you have to go through. Uh, but do see me um, if you didn't get a link to, to go register your child, then you would like one, okay? And I'll make sure uh, to give you that. Uh, VBS, July 26th through the 29th. That's a Monday through Thursday. Now, I have decided on a theme it is Giddy Up Junction, so we're excited about that, and it's going to be good, and uh, Preacher might dress up like a cowboy. Maybe I can talk him into it. He can, he can wear those cowboy boots that Miss Jamie hates so much. All right. That sounds great. Well, that's all I have by way of announcements. This time, our choir is going to come and sing for you. on death row guilty in the first degree son of God hanging on a hill and hell was my destiny the crowd was
shouting crucified It'll come from these lips of mine The dirty shame was killing me Take a miracle to wash me clean thankful for that day when I was released from the chains of bondage and sin to be made a new man in Christ Jesus. Aren't you grateful for that, church? Praise the Lord. Let's all stand together. We'll sing this second song at Calvary. Let's worship together this morning. Years I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary Now I've given to Jesus 
Jesus everything. Now I gladly know him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. The grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Amen, Pastor. <clears throat> Amen. It's time in our service for us to take up our tithes and offering. I'll ask our ushers to make their way to the front um, as they're making their way. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you that this is our opportunity uh, to give back to God according to how uh, richly he has blessed us. And so uh, we need to be faithful to him. He's always faithful to us, right? Amen. We all have uh, money in our bank account. We all have the ability to, uh, to go out to eat probably this afternoon or to, to be fed. And so God has been good to us. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brother Ted, uh, would you pray over the offering? Amen. You can be seated. the way my Savior leads me. Who am I to ask beside? How could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me Cheers each winding path I tread Gives me grace for every trial Feeds me with the living bread you lead me and keep me from falling. You carry me close to your heart. And surely your goodness 
kindness and mercy will follow me all the way my Savior lead me oh the fullness of his love oh the sureness of his promise in the triumph of his blood and when my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day this my song through endless ages Jesus led me all the way Jesus led me all the way you lead me and keep me from falling you carry me close to your heart and surely your goodness and mercy will follow me you lead me and keep me from falling you carry me close to your heart and surely your goodness and mercy will follow me will follow me all the way my Savior lead me Savior lead me hey man I'm thankful for a Savior that leads us amen hey man if you would take your Bibles open them up to the book of first John chapter number one uh, now I don't, some of you that were paying attention and uh, you know that we had a handful of uh, uh, mistakes and, and issues this morning already. I fully anticipated that today. There are two topics uh, that that when I uh, when I preach on them, I I just know that the devil isn't happy and that he's going to try to throw a, a monkey wrench in in the gears and make sure that uh, that he uh, is able to take away from the message. And I think that's what's happening today. And uh, when I preach on the the topic of hell. Uh, that's a very real place. It's something that the devil doesn't like that I preach on. And, uh, and every time I do, there's some issues that arise. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be preaching on sin. Sin is an issue that when it's preached on, uh, the devil often uh, will do what he can to make sure that there is a, dis a disturbance of some sort. And so uh, I'm thankful this morning that, uh, that he, didn't, he, he didn't let me down, but I'm even more thankful that my Lord's not letting us down today. And so uh, 1 John chapter uh, number 1, if you'll remember, some of you may, about, uh, about six months ago, I preached a topical message on, on sin. And and I, I didn't want to preach the same thing, and I, I do what I can to look back at those things because I feel uh, I feel uh, I don't want to, to just repeat myself over and over. But the reality is, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is where uh, the Lord was leading me to this morning. So purposefully this time, I didn't even look back at the uh, the other message that I had looked at or that I had preached about six months ago. And so uh, I do feel again, this is what the Lord would have for us. This 
this morning. Uh, sin is a uh, topic of debate. Sin is a topic that's uh, uh, oftentimes uh, sugar-coated and looked over. And uh, the reality is sin has never been so prevalent in the life of, uh, of humanity that, that I've seen in my lifetime, maybe throughout even in history, other than before the, the flood. Uh, but uh, sin is something that is running rampant. And sin is a, a topic that the Lord Jesus himself addresses over and over. It's a huge deal for each and every one of us. And so uh, this morning, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Light and darkness being a picture of sin and holiness and uh, sin being, uh, uh, being that darkness that uh, stains and that taints and that, uh, that causes uh, uh, the darkness uh, inside of an individual. Uh, God himself is light. There is no sin in God at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Understand, he doesn't say, if you have committed a sin, you are not walking in the presence of God, you're a liar, and you can't do anything right. That's not what he's saying. Uh, the, the idea uh, is a present action. It's if you are walking in darkness, if you are allowing that sin into your life, and you're walking around living your life uh, with that unconfessed sin. If you say you are in fellowship with God, and that's the case, that's who and what you are, then you're a liar. That's not the preacher that says it. That's what thus saith the Lord. Uh, if you uh, say that you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, the light of his holiness, righteousness, uh, living for him, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from our all sin. That's a good thing, right? Verse number eight, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. All of us have transgressed and broken God's law. All of us are guilty of sin. That's what he's saying. Anybody that tries to say other than that uh, is lying to himself and the truth isn't in us. Here's a beautiful promise. For all have, uh, all have sinned, everybody is a sinner, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. That means that he promises. He promises if we will confess our sin that he is faithful and just. He promises that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. He promises those things. By the way, what is it that keeps us as sinful human beings? What is it that keeps us out of God's heaven? Our unrighteousness. So if that unrighteousness and sin has been both cleansed and washed away, we have access to God. We have the, uh, the hope of heaven. That's an amazing promise, right? Verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It's not saying that, uh, that uh, th this verse and the, the verses before that, what he's giving us the idea and the understanding of is that everybody has sinned. If we say we've never sinned, we are a liar. The truth can't be in us. Uh, if, we, uh, if we say that, uh, that there's no sin in our life uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as being alive and being uh, uh, tempted, if we say that we have never sinned, then we don't tell the truth. But at the same time, if even though we're all sinners, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, if we will walk in that forgiveness, uh, then we have fellowship with God. But if we walk in darkness, which we have been forgiven of, if we walk in that darkness, then, uh, then we don't have fellowship with God. And so it's kind of a uh, maybe a catch-22, circular reasoning, however it is we want to look at it. We are sinful uh, individuals. We are, uh, we are all guilty of sinning, but we can't walk in that sin 
and we can't use the fact that we are just flesh and bone as a as an excuse to do whatever whenever we want. No, uh, we have to have the uh, the uh, uh, the drive inside of us to live above sin and to live a sinless life so that we can be pleasing with God, uh, so that we can walk and be in fellowship with God. None of us are sinless, but all of us have the opportunity of being forgiven and walking in the light. That's what he's saying here. So then again, uh, this morning as we're looking uh, at what sin does, all these uh, topics of sin, this is just another, uh, it's another sin sermon. But it's an important one. Because as we go through this life and temptation comes our way, all of us, every single one of us, are susceptible to falling. And it's not just a, a moment of weakness that causes it. Understand, as we are tempted every minute of every day, uh, if we don't have a, uh, that close, constant relationship with him, we make ourselves even more vulnerable. I, I would uh, uh, venture to say that the majority of the folks that are in here today would say, yes, I may have a besetting sin, or yes, I'm dealing with or struggling with a sin even now in my life. That doesn't make you any worse than any of the rest of us. That makes you just like the rest of us. Well, what we understand here as far as sin is concerned, uh, it's universal and, uh, and yet it's not something that we have to give into. So before we get into the, uh, the nuance of this, uh, this message, let's pray and ask the Lord to continue to bless and to, to work in our hearts and our lives. God in heaven, we again thank you for today, the opportunity of being in your house Lord, we thank you for uh, Jesus Christ and the, the hope that he has given uh, uh, that our sins can be forgiven as everyone in here is a sinful human being. Lord, we're thankful that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have that opportunity of sins forgiven, clean, being cleansed from all unrighteousness. Lord, for those that have come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and have inherited that promise, I pray that we would take sin serious. Lord, don't use the day of grace as a, as a license or an excuse to do whatever, whenever we want, but help us to, to understand the, uh, the severity of, of the topic at hand. Lord, help us not to invite or to allow the small, uh, what we would consider small, minute things, uh, sinful things into our life, but that we would take every single one of them just as serious as we should. God, help us to be obedient and God be speaking to our hearts so that when it comes time at the end of our service for an invitation, that we would be ready to approach your throne of grace and receive mercy. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We ask all these things in your blessed and holy name. Amen. So uh, with this topic of sin, I understand that not everybody has grown up in church and, and probably we've all heard the, uh, the word sin before, but sometimes the, uh, the true meaning of that may escape us. And so uh, the first thing we're going to look at this morning is the simplicity of sin, what it is and how it can be identified. Uh, all sin, according to scripture, is a transgression or a breaking of God's law. What he requires out of us, what he requires us to stay away from to have no part in or at the same time the things that he requires us to be a part of or to uh, take into our life any of the things that God has has commanded that his word points out for us uh, to go against any of those things is a sin now, we also live in the, uh, as I already mentioned in prayer, the, uh, the day of grace. Jesus Christ has already come and, and lived and died and uh, arose again that third day. And, and we know that in the book of Acts, he, as Jesus had promised it, through his ministry, that he would uh, leave a, a helper. In the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit uh, uh, coming on the scene and taking up residence inside of every believer. And so uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ who, who has paid that awful price and, uh, for our sin. We have the Holy Spirit who leads us, guides us, and directs us. And as the Holy Spirit leads us, guides us, and directs us every day of our life, we don't just have Scripture to give us understanding as to what the right thing and the wrong thing to do is. We also have the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us who will, who will lead us every step and every choice that we make. And so uh, sin is a transgression or a going against, a rebelling against or a breaking of God's law and the leading of the spirit. 
The book of Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 verse 13 gives us a good idea of what God expects out of each and every one of us. As he has called us to be holy, as he is holy, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, uh, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, when we transgress or break God's law, we're doing neither. We're neither fearing God or keeping his commandments. Verse 14 says, For God shall bring every work into judgment, which every, uh, uh, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Every action that we commit, everything that we do is going to be uh, exposed and is going to be judged by God, whether it's good or evil. So the simplicity of sin, uh, first of all, sin is a transgression or a breaking of God's law. But the reality is, and that sometimes we uh, lose sight of this, is that, the, uh, uh, that sin is a choice that we make. I can't blame the fall of Adam and Eve for my sin. I was born with a sin nature, and that curse has been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, but I can't blame them for it because it's still a choice that I make. I can't blame my parents. I can't blame my social upbringing. Uh, I can't uh, uh, blame the culture in which I live. Uh, I can't blame anything other than myself. My friend Brian that preached for us uh, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, he said when he was a kid uh, that, um, uh, that he had got in a, a fight at, uh, on the bus. And uh, this kid had been picking on him. And Brian, as you saw, he's a big fella. He's always been a big fella. Uh, and so uh, he was picked on and picked on until he couldn't handle the picking any longer. And he laid the kid out that was picking on him. So he gets home and, and uh, uh, word spread that, that he had been in a fight and uh, uh, he, he, his dad finds out about it and he goes to Brian and he says, what in the world happened? And he said, well, I, you know, I hit this kid. And so he, he gets Brian and takes him over to the kid's house, knocks on the door. Dad answers and said, my from what I understand, my son got in a fight with your son, and I just uh, want to know what happened. And, and uh, the other kid comes out, and the whole story uh, is kind of laid out for both of them. And uh, Brian's hanging his head low. Even though he had been picked on, that wasn't brought up. It was just the, the fact that the kid said something, and Brian tried to knock his teeth out. And so uh, they get back to Brian's house, and his dad says, Brian, what in the world happened? And Brian responded with, well, the devil made me do it. And he hears that dreaded sound that, yeah, of belts clearing the belt loop. And he says, Dad, what in the world? What are you about to do? He said, I'm about to beat the devil out of you. <laughs> he said if he would have been just honest with him and told him to begin with what happened, he wouldn't have been in uh, been as much trouble. But the reality is we can't blame our choices and our decisions on anybody, not even the devil who is the tempter, the one who lies, the one who, who tries to get us to give in to these things. Transgression is a choice that we make. Breaking God's law, uh, if we are guilty, which all of us are, it falls, uh, the guilt falls directly upon us and we can't blame anybody or anything else. You can't say, well, the, the preacher didn't tell me about it, or uh, that's not how my parents raised me to, to, to be against those kind of things. No, uh, we make the choice to go against God's law. And not only that, but the simplicity of sin gives us an understanding of sin is sin, and that's all there is to it. It's not that one sin is worse than another is what I'm getting at. Uh, we say, well, telling a little white lie isn't the same thing and isn't quite as bad as murder. Uh, here's what we understand from Scripture. James, the book of James tells us if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. Sin is sin. Uh, there's no reason to sugarcoat it. There's no reason, uh, reason to try to sweep it under the rug or justify it or, or try to put it in a category and to see just how bad off and how guilty we are. Sin is sin. Sin is a choice that we make. We choose to break God's law.
And again, what we read in 1 John, all sin, all of us. If the book of Romans is true, which we believe wholeheartedly that it is, the wages of sin is death, and all of us are sinners, what hope do we have? Well, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is simple. Sin is a choice that we make. It's, uh, it's universal. It's something that all of us uh, face that choice on a daily basis, and all of us have failed miserably concerning the topic of sin. But I'm thankful that that sin has been paid for, purchased, but before we get into that, 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 that's like the very last point in this message. Uh, so let's go back to, uh, to what we're looking at. So we see the simplicity of sin, uh, and now I want to look at the severity of sin. How bad is it? I mean, uh, we, we look at that little white lie, or uh, we think about, uh, uh, you know, just uh, saying this falsehood, or uh, we look at maybe just taking a little bit from, uh, from work, just a paper clip, or uh, we look at uh, having uh, ill feelings towards somebody else, or uh, we look at areas that we, uh, that we don't do what we should be doing. How severe is it? Well, I've already said that Jesus uh, uh, took the penalty for all of our sin. One of the, uh, the biggest aspects to look at as far as the severity of sin is that it took the death of God in the flesh to pay for it. That's pretty severe, right? It wasn't a lamb. It wasn't an individual uh, like me and you that could ever take care of it in our, in, our, in our own heart and in our own life. It took God in the flesh laying down his life as a sacrifice that brutal, bloody, awful death in order for my sin to be taken care of. Here's what Matthew chapter 5 verse 29 says about the severity of sin. He's talking about the sin of adultery and just before this he's talking about, the, uh, he's talking about marriage and divorce and he talks about adultery and he has this to say about the severity of sin. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If you have a problem with what you look at, it's better for you to pluck your own eyeball out. You say, that's pretty severe. That's, uh, that's extreme, maybe. Uh, is that really what he expects us to do? We'll look at that in a second. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If your right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Does God expect us to pluck our eyes out and uh, to cut off our own hand if we have a problem with sin? I know this. He expects us to take it serious. The way that he describes this gives us an understanding of just how serious of a matter sin is. Those sins that we're playing with, those sins that we toy with, those areas of compromise in our life, that big little three-letter three word of sin that we're allowing to, uh, to rule and to reign in our life, we should be taking it serious. Serious enough that if we can't get a handle on it, he says it's better for you to cut your hand off and pluck your own eye out than that you should go into eternity not having uh, that sin taken care of. Sin, as I've said before, my favorite word to, uh, to describe it in its, uh, in its work and its effect in the life of an individual, sin is highly corrosive. Lived in Michigan for, uh, for nine years, and uh, you can't find a car that's over five years old that's not eat up with rust. There are some of them uh, that, uh, as a, uh, early as uh, the early 2000s, that have, that have been exposed to so much salt and the extreme cold and the snow and the ice and everything uh, that the cars are so eat up with rust, they look like Swiss cheese. They drive down the road, and I swear you can hear them whistling just from the air passing through the holes that are in the side of it. That's a perfect picture of what sin does. When we don't take care of it, when we allow it to, uh, to go un, uh, unaddressed in our life, it eats us. 
It tears up our life. It eats us from the inside out. It, uh, it destroys us. It uh, takes away from us. It's something that uh, manifests itself and makes itself recognizable uh, in each and every one of our lives. Sin is highly corrosive. It brings with it guilt and regret. One of the reasons that our country and our world is so prone and so apt to being depressed. I understand that depression is a cl clinical illness, that it's uh, recognized as a, as a chemical imbalance inside the brains of individuals. I understand that it is a medical issue in most cases, but a lot of the times it's brought on because sin has corroded our minds. Amen. I'll, I'll say amen to that. Guilt and regret. How are we going to have a good time? How are we going to enjoy this life? How is it that we can lay our head down at night and have a peaceful night's sleep when we are living with regret? Sin comes with consequences, right? It's not just our sin and the, uh, the filth and the shame that go along with that, but also the consequences of what I've done, not just how it's affected me and my future, but it's affected those that I love. No wonder. There's so much depression going around. Sin is brought upon the individual guilt and regret. When a person commits a sin for that first time or they give in to that temptation, they developed a taste and an appetite for it. You don't, you don't have to tell a child how to lie, right? The first time they get caught doing something they know that they shouldn't and you ask them what happened, they go, I don't have no idea. Where'd the cookies go? I don't know. Who drew all over the walls? I, it wasn't me. Right? They, they, they just know how to do it. And once they feel as though they're getting away with it or, or feel as though it's an option, it kind of uh, snowballs, doesn't it? They develop that taste and uh, cultivates an appetite inside of them. And that's a picture of the, uh, the highly corrosive uh, nature of sin. After they develop this taste and this, uh, this appetite, sin becomes to the individual routine and a custom. It's something that they just do. There, there, look, there have been times in my life where uh, even as a Christian where, uh, where I've been asked a question and the immediate thing that comes to my mind and my immediate answer is a lie. Not, not even because it benefited me in any way, just because sinful nature sometimes reveals itself. I do things that, uh, that please Cody and I do things that, that make me happy and I, I let everything else take a back seat because I have a taste and an appetite for wrong. I've developed a routine and it's become uh, a custom in my life. Sin is highly corrosive. That's part of the severity, but it doesn't stop there. As I've already mentioned, sin comes with consequences. The Bible puts it this way, you reap what you sow. The world addresses it and calls it karma. Reaping what you sow was around way before karma was. When you look back at the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, they suffered the consequences of their sin. They were exiled from the garden. Their walk and their relationship with Jesus or with, with God, uh, uh, Christophany, Old Testament uh, uh, viewing of God and uh, th their relationship with God was affected. Their relationship with one another was affected. Their relationship with, uh, with nature itself was affected. You reap what you sow. Another part of the consequence of sin, along with reaping and sowing, is that reaping and sowing deals with the visible and the invisible sins in our life. The things that everybody knows about and the things that seemingly nobody knows about. The visible sins have consequences, but also the things that we think we're getting away with. We can't hide anything from God.
Another aspect of these consequences is that sometimes we feel as though we're getting away with it, those invisible th sins that nobody knows about, that we're, uh, we're successfully hiding from those that, we, that know us best and that we love, uh, but yet God, God knows all things. He knows our heart. He, doesn't, he knows not just the things that we do, but the reason in which we do them. And part of reaping what we've sown is that it, we may not reap what we've sown right now, but rest assured, it's coming. There is consequence for sin. Sin is corrosive. There is a great cost of sin, according to these verses. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. If your right eye offend you, pluck it out. It's better for and more profitable for you to be without this member going into eternity than that your whole body be cast into hell. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. It's more profitable. It is better for you to go into eternity missing an arm, missing a foot, missing part of your body than it is for you to go with every member and spend an eternity in hell. You know what the high cost of, uh, of sin, you know what the, the result of sin is? You know what the, uh, the end result or the, uh, the desire of the devil when he tempts the individual? It's not just to, uh, to wreak havoc in your life. It's not just to, uh, to get you to do things that are contrary to God. The, uh, the final result and the, the, uh, the ending result of unconfessed sin in our life is a separation from God. That's a cost none of us can afford. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? He's talking about uh, the Old Testament uh, uh, law required an individual if he had committed a sin or if he had done something wrong, transgressed against God, that he had to make a sacrifice for that sin and he had to do something uh, uh, to, to pay for and to take care of that sin. He says this, It... God would much rather us live an obedient life than to require sacrifice from us. And it may not be a uh, sacrifice that it is in the Old Testament, but part of the consequences that we talked about, part of it corroding our life, this, uh, this uh, big little word of sin, uh, part of the problem and the, uh, the payment that we get as a result of wrongdoing is a sacrifice, the unwilling sacrifices that it cost us. We live a life of sin uh, for years and years and years and we wonder why our children want nothing to do with the churches that we raise them in. We live a life uh, separated from God. Uh, uh, we live a life that, uh, that has no morals and uh, doesn't seek after holiness and righteousness and, and we wonder why we uh, give a gospel witness to our brothers, our friends, our family. We wonder why they don't listen. There is consequence, a high consequence and a high price for every sin that we commit. God would much rather us live a life of obedience. Than to have to sacrifice anything. Sin is a simple thing. It's a breaking of God's law that we do on our own. We can't blame anybody else. It's a choice that we make. Sin comes in all shapes and sizes, but all sin is just sin. And all of us are guilty. Sin and its severity can be seen in how it corrodes the life, how it uh, results in negative consequences and the great cost that an individual pays when he goes out into, into eternity with unconfessed sin. So if it's that bad, if it's that corrosive, if it causes that much problem and there's that much consequence, why in the world do we give in to it? The third point is the seduction of sin. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. The temptation to sin does not come from God. 
He lays that out. And then he gives us an understanding of where temptation to sin comes from. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. The seduction of sin starts with uh, how sin is enticing. It, it presents itself in our life in a, in a beautiful way. It promises us pleasure. It promises us a good time. It promises us that, uh, that if we will indulge in this and we'll uh, submit ourselves to this, that it'll bring us some sort of a pleasure. It promises us popularity, position. It promises us power. This can be seen. All sin uh, fits in the category of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It seduces us through what it promises us, enticing us. Sin is deceptive, and here is how. It promises us a good time. And in a way, it'll give us a good time. You know why we're so prone to sin? Because sin is immediately gratifying to my wants. What it promises, it, it, in, in ways, it gives me that. It gives me that satisfaction. Jesus said, uh, Tim, uh, uh, sin is pleasurable for a season, but it doesn't last. You may enjoy yourself right here and right now, but the consequences later far outweigh the pleasure you're going to enjoy at this moment. Sin is deceptive. Uh, uh, the best way I can illustrate this, I, I love to go bass fishing, and uh, I go out there, and I'll get a rod and a reel, and uh, I'll put line on it, and at the end of it, I'll put something that has a hook. Uh, there's different things that I can use, but the idea is I want to put something in front of a fish's face that he can't resist. It's going to look pretty. It's going to look like something that's edible. It's going to look like something that satisfies. Uh, I'm putting it there for the purpose uh, of enticing it. I'm trying to, de de to deceive that fish into biting what I'm throwing. But that fishing bait has a hidden purpose. That fishing bait has hidden dangers. That fishing bait has hidden consequences. Sin deceives us by putting something in front of our face that looks good and satisfying, but we have no idea what it's going to cause in our life. Sin's captivating. When an individual gives in to sin, it results in captivating their attention. It results in causing different kinds of addictions. Once we start, we, on our own, can't stop. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Sin's deceptive, captivating, enticing, And above all that, sin is deadly. Lust, my lust, my desire, through temptation brings forth sin, giving in to that desire. The end game, the purpose of it all, the aim of the enemy himself is to destroy our life and our chances. The Bible says, be sober and be vigilant for your adversary. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Sin is deadly. Something I talked about a little bit ago. The sacrifices of sin. 
when we allow sin into our life, when we allow it to deceive us, when we allow it to have its, its way with us, although it's a severe thing, it's a simple thing, it's severe, it's, uh, it's, it required a, a God in the flesh to die for us, it, uh, it uh, comes with consequences and costs and corrodes our mind, our body, and our intentions, it seduces us by enticing us with things that we want and promising us everything under the sun and in ways providing those things. It captivates us uh, uh, by, uh, by hiding the danger that it, that it presents to us. Just like that lure, that fishing lure, it catches us with the purpose of this fisherman killing it, filleting it, and eating it, right? What are the, some of the things that we sacrifice for sin? We sacrifice our innocence. Young people, I, I was thankful this week. I heard a, a fellow who's about 60 years old. He said, uh, and I've heard it before, but it was just good to me. He said, there's never been a drop of alcohol that have touched these lips. That's an awesome testimony. Amen. Once we've done it one time, we sacrifice that innocence. Young man and young lady, as, the, as this world and as the, uh, the, the ways of this world of darkness uh, infiltrate our, our life and as, as sin is running rampant in our homes and in our schools and in our communities and uh, in our country, as, as they're downplaying the, the importance of personal purity, understand that once you sacrifice that, you can't ever get it back. And I'm not trying to, uh, to, to be crude in any way, but, but I'm saying this. All sin is a big deal. When you invite sin of any sort into your life, greed, the love of money, sexual sin, or uh, the sin of pride, when you invite it into your life and when you feed it and you develop that appetite, it starts eating you from the inside. It destroys. It takes away. You sacrifice your innocence. You also sacrifice all kinds of relationships. Your relationship going back to depression, your relationship with yourself, when you look in the mirror and all you see is guilt and shame, Personal respect and personal worth has been sacrificed. You know why people, uh, young folks are cutting themselves and why they're doing all these things that, that are so far out there and we're taken back when we hear some of the things that our young people are involved in? It's because they don't have any self-worth. They've been robbed of that innocence because they have uh, chosen a lifestyle of sin and they can't live with themselves. We sacrifice our relationships uh, with our spouses, our parents. Uh, we sacrifice our relationship with our children. Uh, my, uh, my cousin who is in the, uh, in the ministry and, and serving the Lord, uh, he remembers one of the biggest uh, problems that his home ever faced was the day that his dad walked out uh, to, uh, on his family to go and to live with a woman that he met on the Internet. And because of that, he has never, that, uh, that father figure that he loved so much and that he adored so much and that he looked up to in so many different ways, uh, since that moment when he was in high school, he has never had a respect for his father since that day. And I'm not saying he was disrespectful, but, but you understand what I'm saying. He had lost respect uh, for that position of the father in his life. We sacrifice our relationship with our children, our spouses, our parents, uh, uh, with ourselves, and uh, most important is uh, we sacrifice when we allow sin into our life, we sacrifice our relationship with God. Because it's hard for us to be honest with God in the first place. But when I have unconfessed sin in my heart and in my life, God can't look on me. We know that he can't look upon sin and, and bless a, a sinful individual. And so in order for me to have fellowship with God when I have sinned, the first thing I must do is come to him humbly and saying, God, I messed up again. And that's a hard place for us, isn't it? 
How about when we've done it for the hundredth time and uh, we say, God, uh, I'm so sorry. I know that you provided victory and I know that you delivered me uh, from that, but I've seemed to have fallen back into that. Shame. Approaching God as a failure and a disgrace in the area and issue of sin. The fact that when we harbor and live in sin that we, uh, we can't have fellowship with God because He can't bless and can't look on that sin and just sweep it under the rug. There are a lot of things that we sacrifice because of that little indulgence. Innocence, we sacrifice relationships. This last one is for the child of God. We sacrifice our usefulness. God has saved us and set us free, done a great and awesome work inside of our hearts and inside of our lives. And even though we don't deserve it, he says uh, that his desire is for us to be a vessel that carries the light of the gospel into this world. Uh, his desire is to use us uh, as unworthy as we are. His desire is to use us to reach others with the hope that has made all the difference in our life. And we sacrifice our usefulness in his hand by saying, I'd rather indulge in this action and this attitude and uh, this way of living. I'd rather do that than be used by God. That's a shame, isn't it? Why isn't God reaching our family? Why isn't God reaching our uh, community? Why isn't God reaching our co-workers? Why is it that uh, we see sin running rampant and all around us is just darkness and we feel as though we're alone? Why is it that uh, we aren't effective in reaching anybody for Christ? Could it possibly be because our actions had led, has led to us being useless? Sin is simple. Sin is severe. Sin is seductive. And with every sin I commit, sin is sacrificial. We're going to look at the rest of this sermon this evening, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, what is your view of sin? How do you view it? How do you respond to it? Do you downplay it, minimize it, or do you see it the way that God sees it? Do you recognize that it took a holy and righteous God dying on a cruel cross to pay that high cost? You know why so many of us as Christians live on the edge? It's because we've lost our fear and danger for what lies beyond that edge. We don't view it as horrible of a thing that God says that it is. So how do we view sin? Ask yourself the question, what sin are you endangering yourself and others with by playing with it? Not just what are we endangering ourselves and others with, what sin, but what has that sin already cost us? And if it's not dealt with, what will that sin cost us? What penalty will we pay if we don't deal with it? And as Jesus tells us, look, if your right eye offends you, cut it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to go into eternity missing a member 
than to go into hell with all of them. If that's how we're supposed to deal and view and uh, treat sin, the last question I have is what sin do you need to remove with violence? Prejudice. Contempt. What do you need to take care of? This isn't the kind of message, as, I, as I've preached on, on that one topic of sin, this isn't the kind of message that, uh, that's going to promote and result in a, a flood of people to the altar because we all have the sin of pride. We don't want others to know that we have a problem. And so I'm going to ask, as we are going to, in a moment, ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Our musicians are going to make their way to the front. I'm going to give you a little bit of an escape. If God's speaking to your heart, I encourage you to respond. But if you, as a concerned loved one, as a concerned child of God, if you would like to come and pray for somebody else, I'm going to open the altar up to you. You see what sin's doing in the life of a friend or a family member. You see what it's doing uh, to, in their workplace. You see what it's doing in our society all around us. You see where it's leading. They just don't see the danger that they're in. If you would like to come and pray for a loved one, I invite you to come as well.